So it's May already and the Home Assistant team have just gone and released the 2025.5 release of Home Assistant, the beta release, and uh, there's some interesting goodies in there which I think some of you will appreciate. So that's what we're going to take a look at in this video. Hey everyone and welcome to a new video on Byte of Geek. So yes, the Home Assistant team have gone and launched the beta release of Home Assistant for May. So it's 2025.5 is the release version and um, some interesting stuff in this. Uh, but as always, you know, what I say in these videos, you know, it is subject to change. You know, if there's something that they find that isn't working properly, then it could be pulled out of the release. Uh, likewise, you know, there could be some last minute additions that go in as well. Um, you know, but you kind of hope at this point in time it is fairly stable. But uh, I know for a fact there is something on this list that they are looking for feedback on. Um, so, you know, whether that's feedback that they will build into later releases, we're yet to find out. Um, but without further ado, let's take a look at some of the new functionality. So to start off with then, uh, well, backups. Now, obviously, the Home Assistant team has done an awful lot of work over the last few months, you know, the changes that they've done with backups. Uh, and, you know, that has gone down well and not so well. And there's been an awful lot of feedback from the community about how those changes have been implemented and what people really want to see. And, um, you know, the team have listened to that and have, you know, worked hard to introduce some of that uh that you know they're kind of like those requirements into this release so um you know there's kind of like three i guess main you know areas in this you know there's one a little uh addition to it but you know that's kind of a, a, an, a an aside to all of the things on the backup so um i think the main one is uh that there is now uh, retention policies you've seen of different retention policies for the different locations of your backups uh, so this is obviously something based upon feedback and I think you know that should be very welcome you know, if you have um, you know different storage locations where you've got a uh, difference uh, in, in kind of the capacity of your storage um, then you know you can set the retention levels for that. Now if you're running the home assistant operating system then you'll know how easy it is to do kind of like you know the various functions and it is super simple and it has you know when you're doing an upgrade of it it, it does have kind of like a bit of a, a fallback uh, position should something go wrong um, but you know what they've done now is they've added on the option of you being able to do a backup as well and you know I would certainly suggest as you know I'm sure a lot of people would uh, as well that you know if you're doing something whether it's the the operating system or whether you're doing uh, an upgrade for Home Assistant itself that, you know, something at that level, you are always wanting to take a backup beforehand so that you can, you can get back to what was effectively a functioning system beforehand. Now, whilst having the option to do the backup is great, not everybody is going to remember to do that. And uh, yeah, you know, it is going to be the case that one day you're going to do an upgrade and you'll have forgotten to go and toggle to do a backup. And just your look there will be a problem and you won't have a really recent backup so um, what they've done uh, to please everybody as best as possible is to now give it give you the ability to go and set defaults to uh, you know all these kind of upgrades so you can decide yourself you know what is the default stance in terms of a backup when you're doing these upgrades I think you know that's a fantastic idea and um, yeah you know that hopefully rolled in with all the other changes that they've done over the last few months should uh, kind of like appease everybody with regards to backups on Home Assistant. Now I did mention there was a bit of a minor one here, uh, not something I've come across myself, but uh, obviously it, you know, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you, you can start a backup and you can restart Home Assistant, in which case your backup isn't going to complete. Uh, so they've put in the ability for you not to do that so that uh, you know the the restart of home assistant has to wait until a backup has fully completed so you know just protecting your system there making sure that you know if it goes wrong you have got that ability to get back up and running 
So if you subscribe to Home Assistant Cloud, aka Navucasa, then you will already be aware of the benefits that you get from that. If you don't subscribe, then it may well be worth checking it out just to see what you are missing on. But well, part of the functionality that you get there is, is related to the voice assistant side of things, and they've improved some of that in this release as well. So, um, you know, they've got variants for the voices. Uh, you know, they've got some examples here. You know, you've got Jason, and then you've got Jason angry and cheerful and excited. And you can use all of these in your text to speech. Uh, responses in your automations and scripts just to make it a little bit more uh, interesting than just a default response uh, voice to everything that you get played out from your voice assistant. Now I'm sure many of you are already aware that pretty much everywhere within Home Assistant you can press the, uh, the letter E on your keyboard and you can get to access to your entity as well. You know, that's all fine and great and everything, but you know, when you're kind of like typing away and you've got things that maybe call the same kind of uh, name, then it can be a little bit difficult to really determine which is which, you know, what what is the device, what area is that device in, and, and you know, is it the right thing to go and use. So they have made improvements uh, to kind of the automation side of things, and this is what they're looking for feedback on the, uh, the, the beta release of Home Assistant. Um, you, this is the type of thing you could probably see being rolled out to other areas within Home Assistant. But basically what it does is that, you know, when you choose uh, an, an entity, then it will show the device and the area that that is listed in. And you, know, you can see that on my setup here. You know, I've got my, um, you know, uh, entity that I've chosen and I've got, you know, that it's in the, the front garden and it belongs to the car. So, you know, makes it really, really clear, um, you know, what things belong to where. Um, you know, as I say, it is feedback. I, I think it's, you know, it's a welcome addition. Um, you know, it just tidies things up a little bit, makes it a little bit easier for everyone. Uh, and I think all of that is welcome in any release of Home Assistant, really. Okay, so next up is in relation to Z-Wave. And, um, you know, I don't have any Z-Wave devices, so I can't really test this out. Um, but, uh, you know, there is three things here. Um, two of them are changes within Home Assistant, but obviously the third one is the reference to the fact that Nabucasa are releasing their own Z-Wave antenna, and it's not so secret. So if you didn't know about that, uh, you do now. Um, but obviously, you know, in order to get Home Assistant in a, in a great place, ready for that product launch, um, you know, they've made a couple of changes here. So they're making adding a device super, super simple, within a home assistant. So, um, you know, that's just going to be, uh, you know, as, as simple as scanning the QR code. And they're also putting in um, support for Z-Wave long range uh, devices as well. So um, I'd really, you know, because I don't use them, you know, if, if you use Z-Wave devices, I'd really like to know, you know, how welcome those changes are uh, down below in the comments. You know, let me know, is, is that something you kind of like, oh, thank you. You know, I've been waiting for that for so long. Drop that in the comments down below. Now, in terms of integrations, well, this is probably the shortest list I've seen uh, to, to kind of like start off from. Um, but, you know, we all know, you know, as the iterations go through the month, you know, other items go on as well. So, um, you know, if you've got solar and, and battery, uh, you know, if you've got an Imeon uh, inverter, then, uh, you know, that is an integration that's on board there. Uh, merely, you know, that is there as well. And um, you've got a couple of other ones there, you know, Amazon S3 buckets and, um, you know, one with, um, you know, notifications as well. So, yeah, let's hope, you know, there's a few more that come along. However, you know, there's an awful lot of integrations, the virtual integrations, um, that have been added, so a whole bunch of stuff that's been added off the back of the Home Connect. Um, you know, so obviously a lot of work being done there. And um, you know, I guess the other one that, well, the, the other two that probably stand out is, is Google Gemini and um, you know a Maytag um, virtual integration off the back of the Whirlpool one as well. So that's what we've got at the moment in terms of improvements to existing. Uh, integrations. Well, there's a couple there that stand out. So, you know, air purifier support for HomeKit. I think, you know, some people will be glad that that's finally arrived. 
um, US support for USB drives on Synology NAS units. Uh, you know, for those of you that that you know plug a USB device in, then that has got to be welcome. Um, Switchbot roller shades and the mini hub. You know, that's got uh, Matter support now. So you know, did a review of the uh, the roller shade not so long ago on the channel, and um, you know there was very limited Matter. Um, you know functionality for that so that is great to see that uh, you know ability to su subscribe to your own YouTube channel I'm going to use that surely I'm going to use that uh, but there's a whole bunch of other items on there um, as I do with all of these videos you know I will drop a link in the description where you can read the release notes and, and see anything else there that may be of interest to you um, but uh, yeah, you know, these are kind of like edge case items here, I think, uh, for, a, for a lot of people. Now, one of the really important things about integrations on Home Assistant is what's known as the quality scale. So, you know, this isn't something that's really talked about a lot, but, you know, it is based upon, you know, how well something is, is written, how well it's tested, how well it functions, um, you know, the, the level of kind of you know how good it is as an integration overall and you know we all happily kind of download and install integrations from hacks and you know we, we generally find problems with them um, so you know it is really good to see uh, you know the home assistant team recognize uh, certain integrations and and you know can see the improvements uh, from them so you know um, this time round for May you know there are four integrations that have reached Platinum level, uh, so OMI, Vodafone uh, Station, ESP Home, that is means you know that is top tier as in terms of an integration now, and uh, Enphase uh, Envoy as well. So I don't recognise that one. If that one really means anything to you, you know, let me know um, down below in the comments if that's uh, if, if that's of interest to you. Um, really, kind of you know, we move on to the ones which are on silver level. Nice to see the SM Lite integration there. I know a lot of people uh, have started to, you know, um, move towards the uh, Ethernet-based uh, Zigbee dongles. So you know, good that that integration is really improving as well. And then um, you know, we've got Whirlpool and Uptime Robot coming in on a, on a bronze level as well. And just because the down at bronze doesn't mean to say they're particularly poor, um, you know, it's just you know they are getting the attention that they need to have. Uh, other things worth mentioning, so uh, you know, Stable Eltron, uh, you know, you can set that up via the UI. Um, on queue by uh, Cola, you know, that has been discontinued as an integration. So if, if that was something you used, uh, then that has gone. Um, other noteworthy changes that they've listed: Matter 1.4 uh, water heat uh, devices are now supported. Um, I thought this one was quite interesting when setting up a new device in Home Assistant. You can now directly name it. I, I thought you could actually do that anyway, but um, maybe you can't. And um, well, that's nice to have that. Um, media players now have an action to search, uh, which is great. Uh, yeah, you know, a bunch of other other ones there as well. Um, some, you know, you, you may or may not find useful. Um, and then this is a, a really interesting one to see that they've gone and put in here. So obviously we all know that um, you know the the Home Assistant team are trying to make Home Assistant as user friendly as possible. You know, it's it's kind of moving a lot of stuff to the UI, um, you know, which makes it easier for people entering the the ecosystem. You know, to be able to get up and running and uh, you know do what they need to do. So. But they also recognise that there's an awful lot of people that have, have grown from the ground up with Home Assistant that still use YAML, and as, as well as people who you know are new to it, you know they will use YAML as well. So you know they're not kind of you know um, discounting that by any means. Um, so what they've gone and introduced here, uh, which I think is is a is a good halfway house, is that uh, you know if you're doing um, you know yaml with your your actions and your automations then you know, you do miss out on a lot of the functionality in the ui now so you get the best of both worlds now
you know, easy option selection in the UI and you can very easily go and add in additional stuff via YAML as well. So you know, it kind of you know, meeting the needs of everyone really right, at, right in the center and hopefully that will be well received. Now, just talking about uh, YAML, uh, they've also gone and added in the ability that if you see some really cool YAML on, you know, maybe the home system forums or something like that, and you think, I, I would love that, you know, it's, it's a lot to type in and ultimately you make a mistake or something like that. Now you can copy it and paste it and it will represent that then in the UI uh, so that you get to see what it looks like straight away. So, um, yeah. That's an interesting one. Let me know what you think about that one. <laughs> and then this one, really, really uh, interesting and uh, probably not for the masses. Um, but, you know, if you've ever seen kind of like devices pop up in Home Assistant, you know, you're kind of like, you know, where's that come from? Why is that suddenly showing on my instance? Um, you know, this may well be something that you can go and use to help with that. So um, we all know that, you know, the Home Assistant uh, set up, you know, it will automatically discover devices and it will, you know, prompt you to, um, you know, if you want to go and configure those. But understanding how it got there in the first place is very much a, a bit of a black box. You know, we don't really know. So they've gone and implemented this functionality and this is really for the, the tinkerers, you know, this is getting into the, the detail of, uh, of Home Assistant. And, um, you know, you just go into your network uh, settings and you can go and look at the different ways in which devices are being discovered. I tried it on my test system and it's, it's quite interesting at, at what level it's it's finding various devices. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, quite useful. You know, I occasionally go and find something pop up onto my uh, instance, you know, Home Assistant's gone and picked it up because it's one of the items that's been picked up by one of the radios and it's kind of like, yeah, do you want to install that? But, you know, how did it get there? You know, it's always useful to find that out. So in terms of breaking changes then, well, uh, it's almost like they were saving them up from last month and have got them all in in this month. There is quite a few on the list. Uh, you know, we've got theming, uh, typography, we've got 17 track, uh, generic thermostat, HomeKit bridge, Google Maps, uh, travel time, y you name it. It seems to be on this list. Some of them are a little bit more obscure and may not affect you, but um, yeah, you know, we all know every month there's some level of breaking changes this time around there just seems to be a bit more than uh, what there was in the previous two months so there you go that is what we are looking at for the next release of home assistant uh you know did you see anything in this video where you're kind of like yes you know i'm at last i'm going to get that in home assistant i can't wait to get that installed then let me know down below in the comments uh is there something there that you're you thinking hmm okay I've got some work to do here uh, or I'm going to leave this version for now until the last minute uh, before I need to make those changes. Let me know in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Uh, you know, it really does help with um, YouTube's engagement and, you know, helps everybody else see the video as well. But as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.